Amen. I will bless the Lord at all times. Amen. And his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Mm. How many know God is good? Come on, all the time. Come on, we're here to bless the Lord, to give him praise. Thanksgiving for being a mighty God. What a mighty God we serve. Come on now, angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. We're excited about the opportunity to share the word of the living God with the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Amen. Thank him for being a keeper. Thank him for being a heart fixer, mind regulator. Awesome God we serve. Awesome God we serve. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your kindness towards us. Hallelujah. None like you in all the earth. Hallelujah. None like you in all the earth. We give you praise, God. We give you honor tonight. We give you honor tonight. We give you honor tonight. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. Thank you for joining us for Midweek Manor tonight. We are believing God to speak a tremendous word to us tonight by the Spirit. We're in Zechariah, amen, chapter number nine, amen, the prophecy of Zechariah, amen, tonight. Thank God, hallelujah, the prophecy of Zechariah tonight. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, we're returning to this. We've been out of it for a little while. The last couple of weeks, we've been sharing some other things that have been very powerful. Uh, but we're back in Zechariah again. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Can you turn to somebody and say, God is up to something good. He's up to something good. You know, when you see all these signs and everything, know that the end is not yet. He said, know that the end is not yet. Hallelujah. But he did tell us to look up because our redemption draweth near. Amen. Thank God for redemption. Hallelujah. We're drawing near. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Let's get into it. Zechariah, the book of Zechariah. Thank the Lord. Chapter number nine. Zechariah chapter number nine. And I won't be very exhaustive tonight in terms of the, uh, what we extrapolate from the text. But we will share some nuggets that I believe we could do something with because it's the word. And how many know his word is living? Come on, somebody say it's a living word, living word. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for a living word tonight. We want to give you praise, honor, and glory for being awesome. Thank you for being awesome. Amen. Zechariah chapter number nine. And uh, when you get there, say amen. Amen. Zechariah number nine, and it says, The burden of the word of the Lord in the land of Hakrath and Damascus shall be the rest thereof. When the eyes of man, as of all the tribes of Israel, shall be towards the Lord. All right, we want to talk about eyes towards the Lord tonight. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. And as you take your seats, can you give God praise for, am I, I got to keep my eyes on you. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on. We look to you, God. We look to you. We thank you. Zechariah, as you know, is a prophet of uh, coming close to what is considered to be the post-exilic period, the period after the exile, the period after the captivity. Hallelujah. This season is about over, supposedly, according prophetically, for the people of God to have gone through this bondage because of their rebellion. Sin always brings about some type of rebellion. Always, um, or, or, uh, rebellion always brings about some type of bondage. I say, let me say it again. Rebellion always brings some type of bondage. And uh, it seemed like you might be getting away with something. Amen. But the Lord has a way of reproving his people. Uh, the Bible says that God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation, knows how to deliver them out of test. How many know God knows how to deliver you out? 
believe, and, but and I'll reserve the unjust for the day of judgment. But, but in the process of bringing you out, sometimes He has to take you through, because uh, God allows trials to purify us. He allows different things to reprove us and to correct us. And correction is direction. Somebody say correction is direction. So a lot of times God will correct you, and, uh, and if we are not corrected, then we're bastards, which we're fatherless. But I'm glad that we have a father that will correct us, amen, correct us and direct us. And so uh, he's sharing this. And I want to say something real quick about prophecy. I want us to think about this because, see, um, you know, a lot of times when people don't hear a lot of preaching or teaching from the book of Zechariah because um, – because it's so caught up in dealing with the period in which it's in, uh, which is trying to help the people to recover from that season of bondage, trying to help people to come out of that season and, and get to the rebuilding of the temple, you know, or getting to build, rebuilding the temple, the reestablish of the territory, and getting people back into the Torah, getting people back into the word. And because of that, um, you know, a lot of times people feel it's so far removed from our lives, but I believe that every word of God is for instruction in righteousness. And even though it might be way back there, there are things that are way back there that's for right here. You know what I'm saying? There's not anything that you can see in the word that's just for them. Because the scripture says, you know, we know that all prophecy of scripture, it was given unto us that we might learn and that we might be able to, you know, it, one thing that's great about it is that you don't have to go through when you see what others have gone through. And the great thing about the scripture, the scripture shows us what happens to even God's people if they rebel. And it should show us, it gives us an example of what will happen to us uh, in terms of God reproving us if we miss God. And how many know we can miss God? There'll be times where we, we do things that God will tell us one thing and we do something else. I know nobody in here is like that. But there are times where God will tell you to do things and we'll do something totally opposite of what God would tell us to do. And there, you know, there are consequences for sin. But I'm so glad that he's merciful. Why don't you give God a praise for his mercy? Because his mercy endures. <laughs> it endures our crazy seasons. I said it endures our crazy seasons. His mercy endures the uh, hard-headed seasons. Can I get a witness? It endures forever. My God, thank you, Jesus. So thank God for enduring mercies. I feel like giving a praise one more time for enduring mercies. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, it's because of the mercy of the Lord that we have not been consumed. All right? So, so, uh, so prophecy, even though it may be for, uh, may, may have a, a, a generational uh, appeal because understand that what's going on here that he's literally speaking to a generation alright he's speaking to a generation he's speaking to his whole generation he's prophesying to an entire generation our word should be that the Lord gives us should be able to cover the whole generation of, that, of people that we're in there's not a word for older people, middle-aged people, young people. The word is for the entire generation. Am I right about it? So, as the old school says, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Every single individual in a generation should be profiting from the word that's being spoken to the generation. Somebody's asking me, say, what do, you know, what do, you, what do you see about, you know, what's, what's happening going on this year? And I'm t I said, you know, this before... Before we got into 2024, I said, bro, I'm not going to, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. And I'm just going to tell you, basically, the Bible says that in the last days, men shall not endure sound doctrine. Folk don't want to hear the word in its purity. We want to hear something that the scripture says with itching ears. We want to hear something that's going to appeal to our flesh. A lot of people do do not want to hear a, a pure and clear word from God because it's sharp, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And how many know that it's piercing the dividing sunder of soul and spirit, even down to the joint and the marrow of the bones? It is a discerner of the thought and the intent of the heart. So that means that you could, you could be looking like that you are, you know, that you own it. That, that, but how many know 
game, recognize game. Come on now. I mean, God's like, you know, listen, you, can't, you can't play no games with me. I recognize game, and I ain't playing no games. I understand what the thought of your heart is. I, d I, d I know that, 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 that you know, because you, you could look like you have one intention, but I know what's behind the spirit in which you do it, you know? And so uh, the prophecy that he gives to Zechariah is, is very, very, you know, foretelling of the fact that even though technically your 70 years of bondage should be over, and you are coming out, you technically are out, getting ready to come out of bondage. But because I know your heart, I'm going to keep this season going for a little while longer. Because what's happening is that, you know, I've done my part and, and put a time limit on what should happen to you in terms of the enemy having an opportunity to run a rush out of you and to be able to... Uh, you know, be the mechanism that I use to rebuke you. However, the issue here is that uh, you still haven't learned anything from it. And since you haven't learned anything, let's keep on going through the process. I'm not going to reward you for no repentance. And, w and when you don't repent, you repeat. And so I'm going to let you continue to go through this season. However, Zechariah 9 is, a, is an opportunity of turning. How many know God will give you opportunity to turn? And, uh, and he's, t he's turning the table in their favor because he's not going to let the remnant suffer for the rest. And that, that's what I love about God. God will not let the remnant have to suffer because of the rest of the people. The remnant of the people will not have to go through the same thing uh, that the rest of the people did. Now, you, you, you might see some things that are similar that you go through that others are going through. But because you're part of the remnant, you're going to see me do some things on your behalf. And there's three things I want to pull out here uh, in this particular prophecy. Uh, three things real quick. And number one is that this prophecy in, in chapter number nine, which he calls the burden of the word of the Lord in verse number one to the land of Hadrick and Damascus, he says, he says here, he's about to deal with what I, can, what I like to call microcosmic manifestation. In other words, he's gonna, this is a prophecy to Israel to how he's going to pull them out, how he's going to deal with the nations around them. But it also shows us how he deals with people that are dealing with us. So, so the first point I want you to see is this, is that God will deal with those that are dealing with you. And, and, and as I came into this new year, one of the things the Lord told me, he says, man, remember, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You never have to fight your battles when they are birthed in the spirit. Because the enemy is spiritual. His attacks come from the spirit. And if you don't fight fire with fire, you know, what happens is that the enemy, and when I mean fight fire with fire, I mean fight spirit with spirit that the enemy will take advantage of you because you're wrestling against flesh and blood and that you're nowhere close to where the battle is really taking place. You know what I'm saying? So, so here you are with water guns, the enemy is over here with heavy artillery. You know, and you're dealing with folk and flesh and he's fighting in the spirit and he's doing things behind the scenes that are literally going to, you know, just keep you in bondage if you don't deal with it in the spirit. And so, uh, so here he's about to share some things. In verses one, verse one, he, he says this, again, this burden of the word of the Lord unto this nation. There are several nations that he's going to deal with. In verses one through, through eight, he's going to deal with several nations. Number one, he's going to overthrow, first of all, and he's going to deal with Tyre. If you look at verse number, verse number two, it says, and Hamath also should it be the border thereby, Tyrus which is Tyre and Zidon, he says, though they be very wise, and Tyrus did build herself a stronghold and heaped up silver and dust and fine gold as mire of the streets, behold, the Lord will cast her out and he will smite her power in the sea and she shall be devoured 
with fire. So notice that he says, I'm going to deal with Tyre. I'm going to deal with Zidon. All right. I'm going to deal with those that are dealing with you that are fighting against the Lord and keeping you in this captivity. But also I'm going to deal with he goes on with the rest of the verses. He's going to deal with Ascalon. He's going to deal with Gaza. He's going to deal with Ekron. He's going to deal with Ashdod. All these different cities that have surrounded God's people, he said, I'm going to deal with them. And so I want to want to encourage us to know that if we remain steadfast, unmovable, God is still a God that fights battles for you. Man, tell somebody he still fights battles for you. He, he deals with those that are dealing with you, you know. And so getting your hands in it only messes with God's plan. Come on, somebody say, get your hands out the plan and let God deal with them. And see, and, and we don't, we, we're not like David. We're a new covenant people. David prayed imprecatory prayers. How many know imprecatory prayers are those prayers when you say, God, wipe out my enemy? You know, snatch him. Now, you might not pray those in the new covenant, but some of you have thought about those prayers. You say, God, go get them. You know, but, but notice Jesus said to love your enemies, pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you. When my name said, notice, notice what he tells us in the New Testament. James and other prophet, um, other apostles said, "Listen," he says, "Man, don't be overcome." Romans tells us this. Paul said, "Don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good." You know, so so good is a force. You know. Um, Knowing how to stand still and know that he's God is a force. Patience is a force. Being able to stand back and watch God's hand move. Hello. Praise is a force because what it does, you know, it, it sends something in the atmosphere that says that you ain't moving me, you ain't shaking me. I still got to praise in spite of what's going on around me. No wonder David said I will bless the Lord at all times. You know, if you think about technically what that means in David's day, remember David literally engaged his enemy. He didn't just look at him. He actually fought him. So that means while David was actually fighting, he was praising God while he was doing it. Could you imagine David while he's warfare and he said, glory to God, chuck. You know, thank God. You know, I, I will bless you. God, you're so good. He's taking enemies out while he's praising God. He said, I'll do it at all times, which means also while he's doing warfare, he was a man of war. And so, which means that while he's doing warfare, he praises God. So you can, you can, you can establish that and think about that in your, in your own personal life. You know, we, we can't just wait for some praise break in church to go forth and worship. Hello, somebody. Amen. Our, our praise should take place when, when we're going through pain. Hello. When we're going through problems, when situations, no, I'm going to bless them at all times. This thing is... This thing is a part of my walk. This is a part of my warfare. So, so it's important, man, of God, woman of God, that we understand that this is how, this is how, we start touching neighbor say, this is how we do it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We praise in the middle of, of crazy situations. So, um, you know, all these things are, are a part of how we deal with it. And, and this is how the scripture is, is, is sharing with us about the importance of knowing that the enemy is going to be overthrown. So he said, I'm Tyre, Ascalon, Gaza, Ekron, Ashdod, and even Philistia, which you are a part of. I'm going to deal with, you know, the remnant or with, with the portion of those in Philistia that don't want to do right. But I'm going to pull you out as a remnant of the people, you know, and that's verses one through eight. I just summarized it for you. But watch this. In verse number nine, he says, Rejoice greatly. So we see, we're going to see something. We're going to see another shift. The second thing I want you to see here is the inconspicuous entry of Emmanuel. So the first thing we see is that God is going to uh, deal with those that deal with you. But number two, God's going to move inconspicuously. In other words, it's like, a, it's like he's moving, but you can't see it. You can't, it's, or it's not the way that you would expect it. How many know God can tell you I'm getting ready to do something, but he'll still move unexpectedly? It'd be like, I didn't know he's going to do it like that. Have you ever seen a move that's like, God, I didn't know he's going to do it like that now? You know? And, and, and that's why discernment is important because sometimes you can miss God if, if you don't understand how he flows. Remember one prophet, one prophet, uh, he was going through. I mean, 
even as a prophet, he goes through. Um, one of the things I wanted to share with you, and it's really important to understand that sometimes God can speak to you uh, mystically, prophetically, uh, and I don't want to get us to a point and get, ever get us to a point where we ever put more time in the mystic or the supernatural or the manifestation to the point that we don't understand that the word is spiritual all by itself. Uh, a lot of times God has to use dreams because of our immaturity. A lot of times God is doing things uh, that, are, that are past our maturity level and he has to reveal it to us in dreams. If we, We've been in Daniel over the last couple of months and, and God had to reveal to Daniel things that was above even his maturity level because he didn't understand, you know. And so what God did, he gave him dream to help him to understand to accelerate him in the earth. So a lot of times dreams and visions are to accelerate. Remember, remember Paul, I mean Peter, as you know, remember Peter was just phenomenal in terms of his, the manifestation of the anointing of God on his life. Remember he would walk by people and his, and his, and his shadow would literally heal people. And you would think that it, somebody like that, they have a, a serious walk with God. But remember, even after he was filled with the Holy Ghost, God had to give him vision to accelerate his understanding. I mean, he put him on the top of the housetop, and he got, had to give him a vision to reveal to him that you are real, real fickle when it comes to dealing with certain people. You do not, you discriminate against non-Jews. You discriminate against them, and because of that, I'm going to have to give you a vision to help you to understand there's no time, amen, for classism and racism, all that stuff in the body. You got to understand, and so I'm going to have to keep talking to you, and he would deal with Peter, this, this is a man that got, you know, thousands of people saved his first sermon on the day of Pentecost. But he still was selective in who he was going to minister to, and God had to deal with him, you know. So he had to give him revelation. Remember Jonah, you know, Jonah, how God had to speak to him and had to use a goal to, as an illustration, that his mercy, he's merciful to whom he wants to be merciful to, not who you want to be merciful to. You know what I'm saying? You can't be selective in how you're going to minister you know, his mercies towards somebody else, you know? And, and because he's not like that with you, he looked beyond your faults. I said he looked beyond your faults and saw your needs. And so the, the list goes on. Joseph, man, I mean, he, he, he had to have a dream. He was a very mature man of God. But the manifestation of what he got was past his maturity level, and so God had to reveal it to him in dreams. And I only say that because... I don't want us to, to get caught up in this because I've used, for example, maybe two Sundays, you know, dreams that I've had that, that had spiritual significance. But I don't want you to ever get to a point that you pay attention to your dream more than you do the word of God. And the only reason I pay attention to certain dreams is because it's in line with the word of God. If I can't find it in the word, I just, I just cast that out. I said, that's, that's craziness. You know what I'm saying? So... So it's, it's got to be in line. And so it, it doesn't mean that you're mature. It means that there's something to you. There's, you've got too much going on while you're awake, so i got to reveal it to you while you sleep. You know what I'm saying? So, so watch this. This man of God here in, in, in verse number 9, we see, the, we see the, that, that he's about to prophesy about something, you know, hundreds of years beyond the time it's about to happen. We know it as the triumphal entry, where Jesus is coming in, riding on a donkey. Notice what he says in verse number nine. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just having salvation. How many know he coming to save? He comes lowly, watch this, riding upon an ass, and upon the colt, the fall, the fowl of an ass. Now, now this is powerful because of the fact that you would think if you're coming to conquer, you're gonna come bust through the door. You know, you coming in with all your military gear on and everything. You come in clad and you know with with all your armor and everything on to let them know. Listen, I'm the King of Kings. I'm the Lord of Lords. But he doesn't roll in like that. He comes in meek and lowly riding upon, you know, a, an economy car, if you will. He's not, in, he's not in the most expensive or the most illustrious. He's not riding on a stallion, a horse. He's riding on a colt. 
which means I'm coming in humble. See, and, and there's something that you have to understand. There are times God don't come in like he had to explain to one prophet. He had to explain one prophet who was going through, you know, he sent an earthquake, you know, and he sent, you know, thunders and lightning, he sent fire, you know, he sent earth, wind, and fire. Somebody say earth, wind, and fire. He sent earth, wind, and fire to shake up this prophet, right? And, and then God spoke to him and said, and every time one of those manifestations took place, when the earth shook, when the wind came, when the fire was, was manifested, God wasn't in either one of them. He said, I, he's, it's, the fire came, I wasn't in it. The earth shook, wasn't in that. The wind, he, he wasn't in any of that. But guess what? He was in that still small voice. He said, when God spoke to him in a still small voice, he understood this was the word of the Lord. It don't have to be dramatic for God to deliver you. You expecting God to come through the front door and all this kind of stuff, the Calvary come to your rescue, God will just give you a word and say, this is what we're going to do in this season. And it's going to give you strategy to get out of what, you, what the enemy tried to put you in. And next thing you know, man, deliverance has come. By the time the enemy, you know, realized what has happened, he over in the corner scratching his head. Now, how did he get out of that? I want you to know that you didn't just come out of situations. God was smooth. He, he got smooth moves that brought you out of situations. I mean, by the time the devil said, man, I, I'm telling you, the enemy going to wish he had never messed with you. Because there are times, there are things that you are going to come out of because of his faithfulness. And it seemed like it was going to take you down, but it actually took you up. And if anybody is a witness that God will promote you through your problems, why don't you give him a phrase? Man, he'll promote you right in the middle of it. Sometimes, that's, that, no wonder he says, to glory in tribulation. I feel like shouting right now. Mm -hmm. Amen. Because tribulation working. Somebody say it's working. If you just stopped right there, you can shout off of that. Tribulation worketh. You know, what does it do? It worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope making not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost. And how many know when you love God, Amen. The way the Holy Ghost is in communion with God, when you, the love of God is shed abroad, how many know everything works together for good to those that love God, those that are called according to his purpose? So, so watch this. This is, this, is, this is bananas. The Bible tells us, you know, very, very powerfully here, man, that, that he's going to come in just like, and we know that Jesus came into Jerusalem just that way. Verse number 10, he says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim. And the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace unto the heathen, and dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even from the ends of the earth. God gonna come in smooth, but it's gonna be like a tidal wave. It's gonna, it's gonna do things. Remember, the Bible says, if they had known. If the princes of this world had known, you know, that Jesus was who he was, if they knew that he was going to resurrect, resurrect from the dead, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. Which means God's got a plan that is totally contrary to the enemy. It looks like your defeat. In other words, it looks like he has the upper hand. Come on now. I said it looks like he has the upper hand. But he don't know, like I told you Sunday, he ain't got you like he think he got you. Tell your neighbors, he ain't got you like he think he got you. Yeah. You know, it, it, you might have cried for a little while, but joy came in the morning. <laughs> I'm telling you. And, and, and the thing that the door that closed over here opened up three doors over there. Now you got to sit down and have the sermon and say, Lord, I don't know which one to go through. You opened so many doors for me. And he gets you to a point where, listen, he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. and all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll direct your paths, plural. There's a lot of paths that he's getting ready to open for you. He'll direct your paths. Somebody say paths, plural. Yeah, man. So, but it, it all comes from not leaning on your own understanding. He's, man, he ain't riding in on a coat. How you going to deliver me? You're supposed to be coming in and taking out. Oh, the Caesars and stripping down the road. Listen, 
The old school said, any way you bless me, <laughs> I'll be satisfied. Come on, man. So if you, got to, if you got to do it real smooth, I'm cool with it. I'm going to flow with you. Amen. And so, so be discerning. Somebody say, be discerning. You know, so you can see God as he moves. And, and, and notice that he goes on. Notice how he says, it, it, by coming in that way, I've, oh, I'm going to overcome the enemy. I mean, triumphantly. Look at verse 11. As for thee also, by the blood of the covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. He says, listen, even the prisoners, because of the move, how God's going to move for Israel, for his people, the prisoners that are in a pit with no water, it's a place, a holding place. It's like a cistern where the water, where, the, where there was no rain. He says, I'm going to pull them out of that. Verse number 12, turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Notice this. This is, the, this, this, this is how, how God uses his people. That's how you know you're part of the, the remnant. Regardless of the fact that the enemy has, has imprisoned you, you still have hope. And it's hard to keep a person of hope in prison. Because they already know that that, well, I don't know, I don't know where I heard this, but there is an experiment with a mouse, right? And he threw him in the water, in a glass of water, and, uh, and they would just let the mouse just kind of just swim, right? Just let him swim. And, uh, and, he'd keep his, and he would keep his head up above water, and then eventually the mouse gets tired, and he just, and he goes. And just before he goes down for the last time, they pull him out of the water and then start the experiment over with. Now, they, they, start, they start the experiment over again and put him back in the water. And this time, they notice that the mouse that in a short period of time was ready to give up because he lost his hope, this time swam for hours and kept his head above water for hours. All because he got pulled out just at the last minute, just in time. And because he had hope, the second time he got in the same situation, he's determined, I ain't going down. Because I came out once before, so I'm coming out again. Where did he get that hope from? From the last time he went through something. And so, uh, this is a, I think it's a cruel experiment, but it shows you a little bit something about hope, doesn't it? Hope doesn't imprison you. It always causes you to say, I, I believe there's a better day coming. I believe that there's going to be a turn and transformation. And, and see, and we're not hoping based on hope. We, we're, listen, we, we, the Bible says, who against hope believed in what? Hope. That's, who, that's how we are. And then that he might become the father of many nations. Talking about Abraham. He said, he's talking about supernatural hope. Abraham has supernatural hope, meaning that I'm not hoping based on on what man can do for me, I'm, I'm believing that the hand of God supernaturally is going to come because he's not a man that he should love. I mean, he got, he, I don't know how he got that being an idol worshiper, but somehow he tapped into the living of God. And once God talked to him, he went for it. He went for it. And he became the father of the faith. And so uh, this is powerful. It says prisoners of hope here. It says in verse number Verse number 12, turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope, even to the day do I declare that I will render double unto thee. So the last thing I want you to see here is this, number three, get ready for a season of double. He said, man, you are a prisoner of hope. Now guess what? I'm getting ready to turn your prosperity. I'm getting ready to prosper you again. And when I prosper you in this season, it's going to be double for your trouble. It's going to be worth the wait. Can you tell somebody it's going to be worth the wait? Man, he's telling Israel, he says, listen, because of the fact that the enemy has captured you and put you in this place where it seemed like you're never going to get out, because God is faithful and his word is true, know 
that not only is he going to bring you out, he's going to make it worth your while. I'm going to make it, I'm going to give you double in, the, in your next season. I don't know about you, but I'm excited for double. What did he do for, what did he do for that man, Job? When Job went through that season of sickness, he lost everything, his flesh, you know, his, his, the, the attack was on his flesh, it was on his faith, it was on his family, it was on his friends, it was on his finances, and all those areas. But he endured that season. Somebody say, endure your season, man. Because that's what it is, it's a season, meaning, and seasons change. And he said to me, he said, you know what? All the days of my appointed time, I ain't no mouse in no water, I'm believing God. Listen, he said, all the days of my appointed time, I'm going to wait till my change comes. <laughs> yeah. so, so he continued to, to wait. And, th and th then what God did, he, he finalized it when he prayed for his friends. My God. And when he prayed for his friends, God turned his captivity and gave him double for everything that he went through. I don't know about you, but I thank, I, I thank God for him just not bringing you out, but prospering you to walk in your purpose. Because, listen, a lot of people don't believe in talking about prosperity, and I, and I don't believe in the prosperity gospel, but I believe the gospel will prosper you. Amen. And what I mean by that, well, because we don't preach the gospel, we don't preach the, 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 no, no, uh, no, no, no prosperity gospel about money. We preach about God, you can't serve God in mammon. But if you serve God, he said, I'll supply every one of I wish I had some Bible readings. According, now, now I'm not going to just supply them, but I'm going to do it according to my riches. So it's not based on what's in the bank. It's going to be my riches and glory. So guess what? You're going to probably get favor, stuff that money can't buy. <laughs> I'm going to give you excess. I'm going to give you overflow. You understand what I'm saying? So, so they're, they're, you, you walk in uncommon favor. I heard Don Staley say that. This is uncommon favor, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm still praying for Don. She got some issues where she needs to be delivered. But you know what? You, you don't have to be all the way delivered to know what God is blessing you. You know what I'm saying? You, you can know when uncommon favor is on you. Hello, somebody. You, you know that it's exceeding abundant above all that you asked or thought. He said, man, what I'm going to do for the remnant of Philistia, I am going to give them double in this next season. Oh, my God. I, I'm grateful for it. Anybody grateful for double? Can anybody receive, receive it? I thank you, Jesus. Man, I come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. Thank you, Jesus. It's life that flows over in this life into the next life. Verse number 15. The Lord of hosts shall defend them. Won't he do it? I told you he'll fight for you. I tell your neighbors, I told you he'll fight for you. He'll defend them, and he shall devour and subdue with the sling, and with, with, with sling stones, and they shall drink and make a noise as though wine and and they shall be filled like the bowls of the corner of the altar he said i'm gonna turn your whole situation around all right just like the bowls of the altar are filled with the oil i'm gonna fill you like that and he says in verse number 16 he says and the lord their god shall save them in that day as the flock and the people they shall be as the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his land. So he says, you're going to be just like the jewels in a crown. See, you're going to be the thing. Listen, in other words, I'm a king, but I'm crowning myself with you. You are, you are my testimony. You are the thing that I pulled out of the dirt, and I'm going to use it. Isn't it amazing? that the things that's most valuable have been pulled out the dirt. I'm getting ready to shout right now. People like gold, amen, by the time you see it, it's already in, a, it's already in a K Jewelers or, or someplace. But if you went to the origin, it wasn't in no store, it was in the dirt. 
It ha- gold has to be mined for. You have to hear, you don't hear what I'm saying. And what God crowns himself with is valuable things that have been pulled out of the dirt. And that's why he says the trying of your faith is more precious than gold. I, I can't get no help in here. More precious than gold that's tried in fire. He says, it's because, because, listen, that, and that's what the trial is for. The trial is not to kill you, it's to reveal you. Gold don't look like gold at first until you take it through the fire. I wish I had some help. You're going to look better when the fire settles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're going to look, look better. And guess what? And God's going to crown you. He's going to use you as his sign that he's moving in the land. So you know how God shows that he's moving? He exalts certain people. He takes people that folks thought would never, um, he said, ain't no way you're using them. We say, See, because I knew their story, and that's why God will let your stuff go out there. He'll let your stuff go mainstream. People be like, man, ain't no way that brother coming out of that. Watch God. I said, watch God. And, what, and I'm telling you, watch God. And, what, and listen, that's what a testimony is. Something that has, has moaned through a test. Come on now. Has gone through fire and hell and brim. Come on, man, gone through all kind of stuff. But you're valuable. That's why God went after you. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. I told you, you don't, listen, you know, I'm telling you, can't nothing add value to you. You're already valuable. It just takes somebody with vision, you know. And how many know he has vision? He see you in the future looking better than what you look right now. Yeah. And that's why he messing with you because I'm pulling you up out that dirt because gold is found in the dirt, bro. Come on now. Yeah, I was, uh, I'm going to close with this, man. I was, uh, I, was talking to the, uh, I was talking to the class last night, uh, the Grief Overcomers class. And I was, remember, I was driving I was in New York. I just got my first car, uh, and I was just driving. And this guy pulls up to me. Old man pulls up next to me, and he and 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 his his car is raggedy. His, his car is raggedy. It's I mean it's to I mean, I'd never seen the cars tore up as this car that this guy was driving. And he pulled up next to me, and I looked, and I said, man, that car. I mean, I never seen no car that tore. But then I looked a little bit further, and I looked in the back window, and it had a for sale sign in it. And I said, oh, man, you got to be kidding. So I started, I started snickering, and God said, shut up. I said, what? I said, I said, what? He said, I need you to shut up. And I thought it was about the man. He says, he says that's how I operate. That's how I work. Because you're not paying attention. This guy is moving just as fast as you are. His motor is still working. That's what it looks like on the outside. I said, you said to me, because this is what I said to myself, who would buy that car? And I can hear the spirit say, I would. And I say, why would you? Because I can see the potential. What you don't understand, that's the way it looks now, but it uh, takes a person with vision to buy something like that. And when you have vision, you know that it's not about what's on the outside, it's what's on the exterior. And as long as that transmission and that motor is perfect, it don't matter what it looks like on the outside. The reason why God is messing with you because he got a vision for you. You don't hear what I'm saying? I don't care how broke you have been, how jacked up your family situation has been. God's got a vision and a plan for you that if you stick with God, watch him turn situation around and watch him give, him double, give you double for your trouble. If you believe it tonight, can you give God a praise? God, we want to say thank you. We want to say thank you. I'm going to end with reading verse number 17. For how great is his goodness. Come on, somebody shout. How great is his goodness? And how great is his beauty. See, man, see how great is his goodness. How great is his beauty. My God. And what doesn't look good to other folks? God said, man, that's what I'm looking for on the earth right now. I'm looking for somebody that's willing to believe that they've got something worth, something of value. And I'm going to take 
my vision and take them to a whole nother level. Oh, my God. I want to say thank you for loving us enough. For loving us enough to endure with us. To persevere with us. To wait patiently for us. Because, God, you could have just wiped us out, but it's not in your nature not to give us a chance. And I want to say thank you for your mercy and kindness, which is great towards us. Come on, in your truth, which endures to all generations. We thank you for, you know, the prophetic word of Zechariah, which shows us how powerful our God is, which shows us how he will come inconspicuously to deliver us. When everybody else has forgotten about us, you're faithful. Somebody just call him faithful right now. My God, God, you're faithful. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your kindness towards us. Thank you for your love towards us. Thank you for your greatness towards us, oh God. God, I just, I just want to say thank you. I pray that you give us discernment and vision to be able to speak life into others. Help us not to be so judgmental that we cast people down before you're finished working on them. We give you thanksgiving for it. We give you honor for it. Now I want to pray for the spirit of discernment. I pray that we will not miss you in this season. And God, whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without us. We just thank you, God, for just continued leadership of the Holy Ghost. We thank you for what you're doing and what you're going to do. We thank you for that what the devil meant for evil. God, you're turning around for good. But not just what the devil meant for evil, but what even we meant for evil. In this season of release, this season where you're trying to turn your people back to the prosperity that you ordained for them to walk in, I pray, God, that we would see your hand move like never before. We want to say thank you for it. Hallelujah. Help us to see the potential in people. My God, I want to say thank you. Hallelujah. Help us to see potential in different purposes and in different plans and in different projects. God's going to show you some things that other people have looked past and you're just like, I'm not going to deal with that. But God's going to show you some things and that other people can't see because you're waiting on God not to move in the earth, not to move in the wind, not to move in the fire. But you're listening to a still small voice. And I want to say thank you right now for the spirit of discernment. In the mighty name of Jesus, discerning in this season. My God, like never before, we want to say thank you. We honor you. We praise you. We glorify you. My God, we want to have your way. We want you to have your way. We pray for those that might be sick in the body. We pray for healing right now. Thank you for your healing virtue. Mm. Some might be in the hospital right now, but we thank you for being a healing God. Thank you for being a healing God right now. God, touch bodies right now. Some even on the broadcast might be going through something physically, but we thank you, God, that you're a God. You sent your word and it healed them. So we want to give you praise tonight for being a healing God. We praise you. We honor you. And there's some people that need you to make a way out of no way, so we trust you. We thank you for it. We know you can. We know you will. We glorify you. We honor you and praise you tonight. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. And if you're online, it's like, I've never given my life to Christ. Well, this is a great opportunity to do so. Would you repeat these words after me? If you mean this and from your heart and you want to receive Jesus, your Lord and Savior, just pray this with me. Dear God, I come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus died and rose again from the dead and he lives. Now, Jesus, please live in me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior save me. I believe, I believe, and I receive you. I turn from my wicked ways and I receive your way. Have your way in my life. Thank you for saving me. If you pray that prayer, please let us know in the chat that you gave your life to Christ. We'd like to reach out to you and let you know what your next steps are, you know, and discipleship. That's, that's the next step, discipleship. God wants to build you up and make you the man of God, the woman of God. You need to be you're already saved, but now he wants to show you how to walk this thing out. The just shall live by faith. And we praise God for it. God bless you. Amen. And also, if you want to sow a seed tonight, you can do so by going to Christian Outreach, 
.com or .net, I believe. You can go there and just sow online. Also, you can go to dollar sign, the outreach, and you can sow that way. And we just pray that the seed that leaves your hand won't leave your life, but go into your future and prepare for your arrival. And we thank you again. Amen for the opportunity to sow tonight. Thank you for joining us for Midweek Manor. May God bless you. May his grace be with you in the mighty name of Jesus. For those that are sowing in the house, Minister Tabor is going to assist you in that. We thank God. Thank you for joining us again in this Midweek Manor broadcast. Have a powerful, powerful week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Can